Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this Red Gaming Tetacom video, we're going to be discussing and analysing tech news, which, as usual, has popped up in the past 24 or so hours. And we're going to start things out with NVIDIA, specifically a possible entry on the user benchmark database of an RTX 2070 Ti. A couple of months ago, there were murmurs of an RTX 2070 Ti being planned to be released. And in fact, even a couple of AIBs uh, actually released documentation that, hey, this is a possible thing but they quickly took that back and said it was simply a typo but now we have this entry that has popped up on the internet and it is certainly suspicious it is worth noting that of course it is not specifically labeled RTX 2070 Ti but if you were to look at the pricing of the 2070 and its bigger brother the RTX 2080 there is a lot of room between the two price points it's around 200 250 US dollars obviously depending on the card in question whether you're going with a pre-overclocked model and so on. There are a couple of things which you're going to immediately notice. The first is a clock speed of 1590 megahertz, but the thing that really raises my eyebrow anyway is 7.5 gigabytes of VRAM. In this one specific benchmark anyway, it is slightly outperforming the RTX 2070. So the 7.5 gigabytes of VRAM is certainly weird because the RTX 2070, along with the 2080, feature a full fat eight gigabytes of GDDR6. In fact, the memory configuration is pretty much identical between the two GPUs. Now, the reason of course that RTX 2070 Ti would exist is quite simple. Well, actually, there's a couple of reasons. The first is that it allows NVIDIA to release a product between the RTX 2070 and 2080, but it also allows them to get rid of dies which don't quite make the RTX 2080 cut, excuse me. So for them to do this, it is kind of a win-win for both consumers as well as NVIDIA. Well, actually, most of the win, let's just be honest, goes to NVIDIA here. So it's possible that one of the reasons we're seeing 7.5 gigabytes of VRAM is maybe something to do with the actual card and the, the way that the, they're binning the actual GPU core. Is if you look at an RTX 2070 or 2080 PCB, you have eight one gigabyte memory modules located on the actual PCB itself, which comprises the 256 bit memory interface. So, I'm not quite sure what configuration NVIDIA are going with. It is possible, however, that the software itself is simply misreporting the amount of memory. And it also could be extrapolated that the uh, clock speed we're seeing as well is being misreported. From a very non-techy perspective and just looking at things in terms of the history of NVIDIA, I would not be surprised at all, let's just be honest, if we saw a TI card. It just makes business sense. And once again, the price difference between the 2070 and 2080 is pretty much begging for a card to fit in between those two price points, particularly as one of the big concerns right now for consumers in regards to the RTX series of GPUs is the pricing. So I suspect that Nvidia will do anything within their power to lower the prices as much as possible because the RTX 2070, 2060 are probably the cards that most folks would want to upgrade to. So it will be very interesting. It's actually a bit weird because if you go back a generation, uh, uh, Pascal, just to clarify, the GTX 1070 Ti was a really good card. And I'm not saying it was a better GPU than the 1080 because obviously the 1080 was certainly faster. But the 1070 Ti, for the price difference, was almost a better buy. So I wouldn't be surprised to given the close proximity of the 2018 and 2070 right now if the TI all but kills the sales of the 2080 GPU. So it'll be interesting to see how all of this plays out, assuming of course that this card is even a legit thing. Next up, we're going to discuss the GTX 1650 graphics card because several images have leaked online and courtesy of videocards.com, we can get a better understanding of what Nvidia are planning for the TU 117 die which is featured inside the card so from what we could see from the zotac model anyway it is going to be a 75 watt 
discrete GPU. So in other words, there is no need to supply the card with an additional set of energies from your PSU. In other words, it feeds itself directly from the PCIe slot. We can also see that it does indeed feature uh, four gigabytes of memory, which basically confirms the things we had, had heard in previously. Unfortunately, the CUDA core uh, count as well as the clock speeds of the card are not confirmed on the box. And I've been hearing, you know, the, the 768 to 800-ish CUDA core number. Unfortunately, all we can do is kind of guess right now because once again, there is not official figures. As for the performance, just thinking about it in terms of, you know, logic, and obviously we've not seen benchmarks yet apart from a couple of leaks, which possibly are the card. But from a logical perspective, we're looking at a card most likely that's going to be roughly on par, maybe slightly better, maybe slightly worse than the GTX 1063 gigabyte. Obviously, the real killer here is going to be the price point. If NVIDIA could nail the card at a really good price point, it should make a viable option uh, in the lower end segment and hopefully, anyway, make cards such as the GTX 1050 and 1050 Ti all but pointless. And that's really the thing right now because in the lower end segment of the market, if you're looking at something like Oh, I don't know, the RX 570. AMD are offering a really good card though. I'm not saying the RX uh, 570 is perfect, but you can get the card for really good prices, like 130, 140 US dollars. Some uh, retailers are offering rebates, particularly in the US, and some bundles as well even come with a game or two, which makes the card an even better proposition. And the 570 is more than sufficient uh, for resolutions such as 1080p where pretty much all the blue quality settings at the highest and it's even better because obviously you can just pair that with a free sync monitor one of the things that nvidia did do rather wisely over the past year or so uh well actually it was nowhere near a year they did this but still one of the wisest decisions anywhere they've made in the last six uh six to twelve months is the uh, adoption of uh the adaptive sync standard so for them to do this it does make uh, cheaper cards in the NVIDIA lineup more viable if you're looking for Twitch-based reaction games. So anyway, it will be very interesting to see how this card performs. The only thing that could certainly cripple NVIDIA's sales is Narve. Unfortunately, we don't know the exact release date of Narve. I've been hearing July, but obviously plans can change. And we have certainly no official confirmation yet in terms of the performance. Once again, according to my sources, I've heard that the card in terms of the top end skew for Narve 10, which is once again only competing with NVIDIA's mid-range GPUs, will put out roughly performance equivalent of, let's say, the RTX 2070 and will be priced maybe around the 250 300 US dollars mark. Obviously, different uh, AIBs will probably put their own bells and whistles, which will make the prices fluctuate. It will be interesting then to see what you can buy from a Nave card that's going to be, let's say, the 100 to 150 US dollar mark. And now we're going to move over to Intel's CXL, which is a new class of interconnect which Intel are developing for a couple of reasons. The first is that they want to reduce the latency of different uh, components uh, communicating with one another. And the second is also so that you no longer have isolated pools of memory. So for example, the GPU having its own pool of memory, the CPU having its own pool of memory, and this requires latency for actually needing to copy data between devices, and overall it's kind of a waste of resources. And it is very similar in principle with some changes admittedly compared to NVIDIA's NVLink. Now, what this standard does is essentially leverage the PCIe 5.0 specification, the backbone of it, but makes several important changes. And yes, I did say PCIe 5.0 and beyond. So let's discuss some of the finer points of this particular specification. So just to reiterate what I just said, CXL is, according to Intel's own words, an alternative protocol that runs across the standard PCIe physical layer. In other words, devices that plug into PCIe and support this will still plug into PCIe. Uh, there are three different protocols which run over a single link. They are CXLIO, .cache, and finally 
dot memory and all of those begin once again with CXL. So IO is basically PCIe like operation. So it pretty much you can think of as almost PCIe like. Then you've got dot cache. So this allows accelerators, so that would be FPGAs, it would be GPUs and so on, to actually read from the CPU's cache. So to be clear here, the requesting device is the GPU and the CPU is the host, or, or you could probably more technically call it the responder. The reverse pretty much is true with CXL dot memory. This allows the CPU to communicate directly to the device itself and access the data which is residing within the device's memory. A couple of notes uh, before we progress. According to Intel, the PCIe Gen 5 does not need to be designed specifically around CXL. So from what we can understand from Intel, um, the CLX Gen 1 uses the standard PCIe 5 components, which is obviously making things a lot easier for adoption. According to Intel's own slides, it allows different devices to share their resources with other devices. So for example, GPU 1 could share the resources of GPU 2, or the GPU 1 could share its resources with, let's say, an FPGA, and doing so with a lower latency as well, which is very important for parallel uh, computing. I am going to be very curious to see the data center future for uh, HPC when it comes to Intel, because this with persistent memory, uh, we've heard about the Optane, which of course plugs in to a DDR4 slot and the data is persistent after power down. Those didn't start at 128 gigabytes and will be up to 512 gigabytes, at least the ones that have been announced thus far, but we can suspect over the next couple of years, of course, capacities will only increase. So in theory, anyway, this will allow uh, Intel with CXL to be able to power huge data sets. Now, obviously, one of the purposes of the creation of this standard would be Intel's XE line of cards. And that's where things get really tricky and you can start making a lot of different usage scenarios in your head regarding how this could be used for gamers. Unfortunately, there is a fawn at the moment when it comes to multi-GPU configurations and it's actually not the fault of anyone necessarily in the industry, it's just kind of been how it is. I'm gonna give you the very brief variant here because this is more news and slight bit of technical analysis. But essentially back in the days of like, let's say DirectX uh, 11 games, developers didn't really need to do that much. Um, the driver would abstract a lot of the work and therefore uh, companies like uh, NVIDIA and AMD would produce uh, Crossfire or SLI profiles and at times of course they would work with developers if necessary to optimize the games further, blah 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 blah. And things weren't too difficult so it meant that you could buy let's say two GTX 780 Ti's whatever and relatively easily developers could get SLI profiles working. DirectX 12 and also Vulkan, because the two APIs in the nutshell are very similar to one another, kind of turn this on the head. But because the good news about Vulkan and DirectX 12, I'm just going to say DX12 for the rest of this video, but do know it basically applies to Vulkan as well, is that well, it takes less resources. You've got much level, uh, much higher levels of parallelism from the CPU. So the CPU can issue multiple draw calls from different CPU cores and threads, which is good. You have lower levels of uh, overhead from the driver. You've got lower levels of uh, overhead from memory and all of that stuff. That's a good thing. You also can address the GPU to the metal. So it's much more console-like in performance. That's also a good thing. The bad thing is it also means that developers have a lot more work to do and it's easier for developers to be like, oh, that crashes the driver. And it also means that when you're coding multi-GPU, it's a lot trickier. Oh, and if you want a lot more information on this, I've actually had several interviews with the folks over at Kronos Group who are responsible for uh, maintaining and updating the uh, Vulkan and OpenGL and other standards, so you can go and check those out on the channel. But the two long didn't read here is that when you're dealing with multiple GPUs, developers now need to do a lot more work. And how this comes in to Intel's GPU, well, we don't really know how it would play out um, with Intel XE and multiple uh, 
uh, Intel XE GPUs on a system which in theory would be for consumers, in other words, mainstream level and support CXL. Um, so in theory anyway, it would be easier for devices to share data with one another and would do so at lower latency. But how the software stack itself would play into things, how Intel would write their drivers and so on and so on, so that we still don't have the same issues that we currently have with DirectX 12 uh, or whatever low level API is gonna be available at the time. Well, that's gonna be rain to be seen. It's quite interesting though, and I once again spec for HPC performance cases, it's going to be pretty damn cool, although obviously there are several competing standards. As a slight aside as well, Intel are definitely pushing towards multi-die GPUs, and I say definitely, but there have been several hints and also leaks from the company that that's probably what they're going to be doing. So it's all gonna be very interesting to see how Intel uh, manage to kind of enter the market with the GPUs. And it's also gonna be fascinating to me how the other two established competitors, once again, uh, Nvidia and AMD, also respond to Intel's threat, assuming, of course, they can produce a GPU which is going to be high performance enough. Anyway, with all of that said, hopefully you have enjoyed the video. If you did, well, normal stuff, like, share, comment below and subscribe because that helps us out a ton. You can also find us on Patreon, which is linked in the description of this very video, along with some Amazon affiliate links. So if you need to buy yourself some new socks, then by all means use Amazon affiliate links and it gives us a few pennies. But with that said, take care of yourselves. Bye for now.